Every time I share my presentation, I have to prepare myself psychologically and emotionally for a very overwhelming experience. And as I sat here this morning singing Amazing Grace, I also thought of the song, How Great Thou Art. And what I'd like to do this morning is share with you why the songs are so important to me. For until six years ago, I really never wanted to be in a church. <laughs> And in 1972, when I shared my presentation for the first time in my life, I never dreamed for a moment that one day I might be flying all over America and Canada, sharing macaroni at midnight, the title of my book. I never dreamed for a moment that one day I might be inside a church telling people about my life. I never dreamed for a moment that one day I might have six lovely, beautiful little girls. Most men don't dream about that. They have nightmares about that. You know? <laughs> but I never dreamed as a child that one day I might be able to speak. And this morning I'd like to share with you what it feels like to be an Indian child growing up in poverty, not knowing how to speak, how to share but what I am on the inside. I'd like to take you with me with my little box of macaroni. The first time anyone ever heard my talk in 1972, they gave me that box of macaroni, and now, well over 1,500 times, all over America, Canada, we've been on television, we've been on radio, they're making a movie called Macaroni at Midnight. I never dreamed that one day I would ever have that opportunity. So I'd like to take you with me this morning on a journey. And as we go on our journey, I'll be using my hands to show you how I communicated as a child and to introduce you to my culture, my world, before I ever knew your world. I'd like to take you with me this morning on a journey. We'll go back many, many years to the year 1939. And as you come with me on our journey, I want to show you with your eyes many, many things about my people and my culture. I'd like to have you meet my mother and father way back in North Dakota. My mother and father were very, very poor Indian people, but they were very proud Indian people. With their own hands, they cut down the trees and they built a log cabin, their own log cabin with their own hands that made them feel in here very proud. And they wanted to have a family. And when they had their first son, a lovely young girl, people down in the valley community, and my people went up in the hills, they came up into the hills, and they took away my mother and father's first child. For my mother was only 16 years old. And the people in the valley community the white people did not feel that my people, being so young, ought to rear a child. So they came and took away my mother's firstborn child. That hurt my mother very, very much. And for many, many years, she spent hating people. Forty-two years later, today, that young, beautiful child still hates white people. She hates the mother who let her go. That 42-year-old woman today, my older sister, does not understand that people in the valley community took her away. My mother didn't want her to leave. They came and took her away. My mother was powerless. But her 42-year-old daughter today hates with a hate that only I knew so well. My father was very, very angry. And he began moving into a world called alcoholism. And he almost never came out of that world for many, many years. But he and my mother decided that they ought to have another child. And my father wanted a son. A son who would be big and brave like him. A son who would become a fisherman, a hunter. But as I came into the world, my father became very upset. For he noticed three things about my birth. First he noticed I had only half a nose 
on the left hand side of my face. Then he noticed I had no upper lip. And then when he looked for the third time, he saw a huge hole in the top of my mouth. And in 1939, we knew nothing about my kind of handicap and condition. We didn't even know what to call it in 1939. We didn't know what to do with a severe cleft in the palate. Cleft palate. The doctor simply threw up his arms and walked out the door, telling my mother and father, send him away. Send him away. He'll never learn. He'll never speak. And then the doctor told my father words that caused my father to go further into the world without all of them. He told my father, your son is a freak child. My father could not handle that. My father didn't want a freak child. My father wanted someone to be like him, a hunter, a fisherman, somebody big and strong. My father ran away, and he kept running away and running away for many, many years. My father didn't want to know the son that he brought into the world. In fact, deep in his heart, my father hoped that they might come and take him away too. But my mother hung on to me. She pulled the blanket over her head, put her arms around me, and for many, many days she lay waiting for them to take me away. And they came and took me away to a very small rural community hospital where they knew nothing about my handicap and condition. They took the left-hand part of my nose, they pulled it over to the right-hand side of my face, giving me a very flat nose. They tried to repair the upper lip and did a very crude job. And then for 17 years, they did nothing about the hole in the roof of my mouth. And for those 17 years, I could not speak as I speak today. In fact, for 17 years, you could not understand me at all. My mother and father could not understand the sounds that came out of my mouth. They were very, very garbled sounds. Nobody could understand what I was trying to say. Seventeen years. For the first nine years of my life, I remained at home, hidden from my community. People down in the valley community did not want to see me. They were afraid of me. They thought I might hurt their children. They thought I might bite them. They thought I was mentally retarded. They were afraid of me. For nine years I remember learning what it felt like to be lonely and hidden and isolated from my community. Not learning how to play with other children. Not having anyone to run with me and play games and touch my life. A loneliness that I hated for nine years. When people came up into the hills to our log cabin, my father and mother would take me and put me under the bed or hide me behind the round pot belly stone for they were fearful of being ridiculed. I didn't want to be hidden from people. I wanted to reach out and touch them and have them touch me. The loneliness in me wanted to reach out. When I was nine years old, the superintendent of our public school came up into the hills and told my mother and father that they must send me to school. I didn't know what school meant. I couldn't understand the words public school. Couldn't imagine what that meant. And so my mother pushed me out the door and I went to the white man's school. And when I got to the public school, I began learning what it meant to move into a foreign culture. For as I walked into the public school, Oh, children gathered all around me. They began looking at me. They began saying things to me like, You look funny. You can't talk. And then they called me Donald Duck. Say, quack, quack. You can't talk. Donald Duck. Engine, engine. Funny, funny. Mental, mental. Donald Duck. Say, quack, quack. You can't talk. You don't belong here. And then they began calling me the same names that the doctor had told my father, freak, you're a freak, you're a freak. And I remember running home that first day, putting my hands over my ears, trying to run away, trying to block out the sounds that came into my ears 
and they hurt me in here. And I ran, and I ran with tears running down my eyes. And when I got home, I tried to tell my mother and father, I, I tried to show them that it hurt in here. They were laughing at me. They were poking me. They were calling me names, but my mother and father couldn't understand me. And so the next day, they pushed me out the door again. And on the second day of school, children came up and began pushing me, knocking me up against the building, taking my hair and throwing me up against the wall, kicking me, slapping me. And I'll always remember one child coming up to me. And that child spit all over me. And in my book, I can't write about what it feels like to have a child spit all over you. I remember that night laying in my bed with my hands over my ears and shutting my eyes and trying to blot out everything that had happened to me that day and, and it wouldn't go away. And as I went back to school on the third day, I wanted the teacher to just reach out and touch my life. But the teacher knew nothing about handicapped people. The teacher knew nothing about my people. The teacher didn't want to do anything with my life, and so she took me. And in her room, she had a little closet where she kept all of her mop buckets and pails for washing the floor. And she took me in front of the children, and she put me in that little room. And I'll always remember a nail at the top of the door. And as I was on the inside of that room, I could hear the nail go in the hook. And as the nail went in the hook, that meant that I was locked on the inside of that room. And I remember for many, many days, sitting in that dark black room, isolated from the other children, hearing them laugh, hearing them learn, hearing them talk about all kinds of things that I wanted to learn about. But when you're locked up on the inside, you began hating what's happening on the outside. And I began living in two worlds. In one world, I wanted to speak like the other children. I wanted to be like the other children. I wanted to be with the other children. And then my mind would snap. And in that little dark room, I would begin imagining that in my hand, I had a knife. And when a child laughed at me, I would take my knife and I would Right, that child. And if that didn't work, and in my world, I could run home and take my father's rifle, and I'd run back to the school, and if I aimed my rifle very carefully, and if my father had aimed his rifle, I could shoot every child who laughed at me. And in my heart, I began hating everything around me. I began hating the public I began hating the teacher for locking me up in that room. I began hating my mother and father for sending me to school. And in an Indian world, you learn as a young child that you never hate the man or woman who brings you into the world. Never. And I began hating my family at a very young age. I never went through the second grade for the second grade teacher wouldn't have me, so they promoted me to the third grade. And when I ended up in the third grade, I couldn't learn like the other children because they were ahead of me. I was hungry. The poverty in my stomach would pull my muscles in. And when you're malnourished and hungry, your brain cells don't grow the way they ought to. And the other children were learning more rapidly than I. I remember trying to understand the word electricity. I could never imagine how electricity ever worked. For in our log cabin, you didn't switch on a light. You didn't plug anything in. And I couldn't understand that word. And the teacher would laugh. Because I couldn't understand a simple word like electricity. What I couldn't tell her was that I couldn't even understand the word airplane. I couldn't imagine a steel bird with wings flying. I had never seen, I had never touched, I had never experienced an airplane. And that went on year after year, and I fell behind the other children. And then they began calling me words like retard and Stupid, thinking I could not learn at all, and yet 
I could learn many things, but I couldn't tell anybody. One day after school, and until six years ago, I could never share them. It took me that long to overcome the hurt. One day after school, a small group of children gathered around me. They asked me to go on a walk with them, and I became very excited, and here I thought, ah, oh, now they'll like me. Now I'm going to be one of them. They want to touch my life. And I went walking with them with joy and anticipation in my heart. And as we went walking, I noticed that we were going up into the hills, away from the community. And I became worried when I saw some rope coming out of a tent pocket. And in the next few moments, we got to a tree. And I felt the rope being tied to my hand behind that tree. And then it took my leg and they tied my leg to that tree. And then for what seemed to be psychologically like hours, each child came up. And with their fists, they hit me. And they hit me until the blood could run no more. And in my book, I try to explain what it feels like to be tied to a tree and have children punch you and punch you. And then you watch them walk away. And if you're tied to that tree up here, you're thinking, how will I ever get away from here? And if someone unties me, like the old man with long hair who came walking through the hills, he saw me, he unties the rope, he set me free. And as he set me free, I remember tears running down his face. But I was too worried about those tears. I was worried about my father. When I arrive home, what will my father say? I have blood all over my clothing, and I have no other clothing. Surely my father will be angry. And as I walk into the door, I see the anger on my father's face, and I can't tell him with my lips what happened. I try to show him that they tied me, <laughs> but he doesn't understand. And then I see my father come at me, and I began walking away, trying to feel the wall behind me wanting to move myself into that wall, thinking if I'm part of the wall, he won't hit me. But then I feel years of anger coming out of my father, and he hates me. And like the young children, he throws me, and he throws me, and he tells me I hate you, and he kicks And I can't tell him, I can't tell him that that hurt so much. I began thinking about suicide at a very young age, trying to jump into the water, trying to jump off of a tree. And every time I went to jump, every time I wanted to leave that tree, then my hand just wouldn't open. And my feet would never follow me. I couldn't understand that. And so I became a juvenile delinquent. And if I could bring all of you back to my community today, they will tell you about the nonviolent that they remember. Now he's famous, but they remember him then. And he broke in the home. And he stole the food. And he devoured the food, trying to overcome the hunger. And he would take an object. And he would pick up that object. And they would watch him take that object, and he would break it, and he rip it, and he tear it apart, and then he throw it on the floor, and he was thinking all the time, he'll never laugh at me again. I'm going to stamp her out until he can't breathe. I hate him. He'll never laugh at me again. And then they threw him in jail. And as he went to jail, his father came into the courthouse. And they let me walk home with my father. And in my book, I talk about that half hour journey with my father. It was the first time in my life that my father and I ever shared time together. I had always wanted my father to love me, to be close to me, to accept me, even though I couldn't speak well. And for that half hour, I walked home with my father. And I began thinking, oh, everything will change now. 
My father came in jail. He offered to pay back the money. My father loves me. He'll never hurt me again. I'm walking home with my father, side by side, in the eyes of the whole community. My father and I are walking home together. I wish I could tell you what it felt like to be a son walking next to my father. And as we arrived home, my father once again, in the eyes of my family, hurt me very, very much. For I had humiliated him. And that night, as he fell asleep in the rotten chair, I went to the wall and I took the rifle. And I remember thinking, as I aimed the rifle, this will be a perfect day. And I took the rifle and I aimed it very carefully. And as I went to fold the trigger, my mother awakened and hit me harshly on the nose. I dropped the rifle, but I did not drop my intention to kill. The heat overwhelmed me. Macaroni at midnight is the story of how my heat turned into love. There was a white woman in our community, a church woman, a very powerful woman in our community, a very wealthy woman. She owned many, many things. She had much money. She knew nothing about my people. She knew nothing about handicapped conditions. She knew nothing about poverty, yet she heard about me, which was an hard to do in our community, and she wanted to free me. And one day my grandmother took me to her, and the white woman looked at me, and she couldn't understand that I could not speak clearly. And so she told me to wash her automobile. <laughs> I'd never washed an automobile in my life. And I didn't know what to do, and I began walking away from her. And she kept looking at me, and then she began telling me in her own language, turn on the... And there was a word I couldn't understand, and I began looking at her. She said, turn on the... Then she started pointing. And I, I, I looked around, I didn't know what she meant. And then she... Then she... She took my hand. Her hand touched my life. And she took it over to a round knob. And as she helped me turn on the knob, she called me a brother. But then she took my hand again, and we turned it on and off and on and off. And I began learning that running water came out of my house. And then she took my hand and showed me how to wash her automobile. She made me do it four times <laughs> in one afternoon. I hated her immediately. <laughs> but then she came into my world. And she put in the palm of my hand a whole quarter. I mean, a real quarter. And if I put that quarter in my pocket, something happened in here. I wanted to do more for her. I, I wanted to learn more. And so she took me into her home. <laughs> if you can only imagine this white woman never been around Indian before, living in a mansion compared to our log cabin. And as I sat down at her table with the very frilly, very refined linen tablecloth, she had a glass for water, a glass for milk, a glass for uh, juice. She had a bowl for this, a bowl for that. Silverware here, silverware. I thought the woman had a problem. <laughs> <laughs> and I began eating. And when they interviewed the white woman several months ago to do this movie and all that, they asked the white woman, did that really happen? Did that really happen the way he tells it? And the white woman said to all the media, he hasn't told you the half of it. When he came into my home, he ate. Oh, he didn't chew his food. Oh, never. But he ate. Everything went down that hole, and he kept eating, and eating, and eating. And in my book, there's a whole chapter where I tell about having seven helpings of everything. And then I ate more. And as I ate more, the pain began going away. And as I ate more, I saw the white woman loving me, telling me, have all you want. Come and eat with me anytime. And I took her at her word. <laughs> The next morning, 5.30 in the morning, I'm ringing a little round bell, and when you push the bell, somebody comes to the door. You push the bell, somebody comes to the door. And I began learning that when I came and pushed that bell, she was always there, 5.30 in the morning. Let me tell you about this woman. She used to sleep <laughs> till 10 in the morning, have her hair done every week. No more. No more. No more. 5.30 in the morning. 
She let me in, and she began teaching me all about electricity, taking me a hundred miles away to a huge department store. I'd never been a hundred miles away in my life, and as I walked in ahead of her, she told me to open the door. As I went to open the door, the door opened automatically. I fell flat on my face. But I began understanding electricity and then out to an airport where I felt, I saw, I experienced a steel bird with wings. And I began learning the word airplane. And back to her home where she turned on a box that had another faucet on it. And as I turned on that faucet, a picture came on the box. And as I looked at the picture, I heard and I saw somebody call Donald Duck. And as I heard him say, quack, quack, then I began understanding why they called me Donald Duck. And then she turned on another little machine with another faucet on it. And I could hear the garbled sounds come out of my mouth. And as I heard the garbledness come on the machine, I began wanting to change. And night after night, year after year, hear me this morning, it did not happen in one month. It never happened in one year. It happened in many, many, many years. This woman took me into her life. This woman made me come into her home. This woman taught me. This woman gave me confidence. This woman hired me to work. This woman sent me. This woman opened a book one day, a book she called a Bible? What's a Bible? And she would read that book to me, and I couldn't understand it at all. But I remember seeing her walk into her bedroom. And I remember seeing her lowering her head, praying. I remember seeing her read her Bible day after day. When people laughed at her, when her church told her not to work with me, for I was from another world, when her church ridiculed her, when they laughed at her, I saw her go into her home, and she would open that book, and she would read that book, and then she would pray, and then she would come out and help me even more. And when her husband told her, when her mother told her, you won't have any of our money, the woman continued helping me. Macaroni at Midnight will tell you about one night when we turned on the machine and after many years the white woman and I heard me make a sound that sounded almost like a real M. M. And the white woman said, don't use your hands. You can't use your hands when you talk in public. So I put my hand down, and once again, I tried so hard to make... M. M. And macaroni at midnight is about my running home that night, up in the hills, shouting, M at the top of my voice, running home. My mother had a hot bowl of macaroni waiting for me. And if we ate the macaroni around the midnight hour, I waited until we ate all the macaroni. And then I looked at my mother, and for the first time in her life, I'm 13 years old now, for the first time in her life, she hears me make an M. <sighs> And Macron at Midnight tells you about the social workers, the educators, the church people, the policemen. Everybody in our community began waking up. Everybody began saying, he can learn. He can even, he can almost, uh, he... And they sent me away, thousand miles away, to Minneapolis, Minnesota. There they gave me a new nose, a new lip. They put a round steel plate in the roof of my mouth. And then when I was 17, they began giving me six years of speech therapy. And I graduated valedictorian <laughs> from my high school class. And as I left my high school, I left my culture, I left my people, and I left the white woman. I ran away for many, many years. And in my book, you'll read about my many, many years of running away. In fact, in 1964, I ended up in San Francisco. And there I became a hippie. I became an underground revolutionary and I began paying back all the hate I had in my heart. 
And I'm not talking about that this morning other than to tell you that all those years that I spent paying back the hate never made me any happier. I was still lonely and frustrated and unhappy. Twelve years ago in Michigan, I met another white woman who was very much like the white woman back home. She came from a wealthy family, one of the most beautiful women in America at the University of Michigan. And I decided to marry her for her money, for her beauty, and for her power. And if my wife were here this morning, she would tell you that's exactly why I married her. I married into one of the wealthiest families in Detroit, Michigan. Unknown to me, they were a Christian family. <laughs> and I didn't understand Christianity at all. For five and a half years, my wife and I struggled, we fought, we struggled, we fought. My marriage went on the rocks. My first daughter hardly knew <laughs> her father. Five and a half years ago, with the help of my wife, I came to know Jesus Christ. We found a small Baptist church in Minnesota where the people were warm and loving. And as we walked into that church on Easter Sunday morning, <laughs> 1974, something happened to my heart. And as I heard a man talk about Jesus Christ, I heard him say, Matthew 7, 7, and something clicked in my mind. Matthew 7, 7. Matthew 7, 7. Where have I heard that before? Matthew, the woman, the woman. As a child, the woman had kept telling me, Matthew 7, 7. Remember that, Don. If you don't ever remember anything else, remember Matthew 7, 7. Ask, seek, and knock. And that night, as I heard this man tell about his life, and as he referred to Matthew 7, 7, I went home with my wife and Lisa, my oldest daughter. And that night, my wife will tell you, I rolled around on the floor. I couldn't sleep. Something bothered me. The next morning in my automobile on a major superhighway in Minnesota, I turned off my car. And at 8.30 in the morning, September 30th, 1974, I rolled down the window of my car and I cried out, God, I want Jesus Christ to come into my life. And at that moment in my life, Jesus entered my heart. And I could feel the hate <laughs> moving out. And I could feel the love moving in. And as I began reading my Bible, as I became familiar with 1 Corinthians chapter 13, I began understanding the love that the white woman had shown me. I began learning about the love that my wife had shown me for five and a half years. I began understanding the real meaning of love. As I got into First Peter, and this has been my life verse. First Peter, chapter 1, verse 22. Now, you can have real love for everyone because your soul has been cleansed from selfishness and hate when you trust with Christ to save you. So see to it that you really do love each other warmly with all of your heart, not part of it, with all of your heart. For now, you have a new life. It was not passed on to you from your parents, for that life will pass away. This new life will last forever. I'd like to challenge you this morning. John thirteen thirty four. Love one another, even as I have loved you, so that you can love one another. Had it not been for the love of Jesus Christ working in the white woman, I would not be here today. <laughs> I would not understand Christ today. I would not be able to teach my six daughters all about Jesus. I would not know how to pray around our family table. I would not be able to stand up here time after time after time sharing my testimony if I did not know Christ. When I go before the movie cameras and the sweat is running down, I would not be able to tolerate that without Jesus Christ in my life. I would not be able to live as I live today without knowing Him. And I only have that because one person told me and showed me the love of Jesus Christ. Will you pray with me? Father, I thank you for answering prayer this morning. 
I thank you, Lord, for the quiet time coming here where once again you opened my heart. You gave me that peace and that confidence that I need in order to share. Father, I thank you for Jesus Christ. I thank you for coming into my life, into my heart, into my family. I thank you for showing me that church in 1974, the church that taught me how to understand what the white woman did in my life. I thank you for Matthew 7, 7. I thank you for Peter, 1 Corinthians. I thank you for Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. Father, I thank you for my family. I thank you that they all know you. Lord, I thank you for this church. I thank you for the great Brethren Church and how I have learned so much even in the last year. And I thank you for the people here this morning, Lord, that they might go forward now and share your word and be a testimony to the love that you have shared with them. If there be anyone here this morning, Lord, that may not know you or may not have let go of that hate or bitter feeling, or anger, or whatever the emotion might be, Lord, that I would pray that they would ask you to take it away from them. And if it be anyone here that does not know you, Lord, then I pray if it be your will that they will have heard the Holy Spirit this morning. Father, I just thank you for the admonition in John. Help us to love one another in spite of any differences we might have. Lord, I thank you, and I praise you, and I give you all the glory. In thy holy name, amen.